Good evening. Welcome to the Wheeler Centre. I'm Hilary Harper. I present the Saturday Breakfast and Morning Show on 774 ABC Melbourne. It has nothing to do with classical or orchestral music at all. But I did have the pleasure of hearing Richard Gill chatting on the radio with Alan Bro at one point about music. And so I'm very excited at the chance to tease out some of the wonderful stories in this memoir tonight. And reading it, a picture emerges of a timid man, indolent, inward-looking, who wilts when the going gets tough and has trouble expressing his views. <laughs> As you know, that's complete piffle. Luckily, he's written his own story of how he came to be who he is, is today, one of Australia's, uh, the Australian arts community's most vibrant and energetic thinkers and doers, and uh, one of the most innovative educators. He's about to leave his position as founding music director of the Victorian Opera, and I think he's going to go and light a fire under some other bodies that he ends up working with. Uh, and he was also a very cute baby there at Pictures. So let's begin. We've got uh, time for a chat and questions afterwards, so do get, get your, your questions ticking over. And uh, Richard will be signing his book at the end as well. Now, Richard, it's a rather Bacchanalian title. I expected a bit more debauchery, and we will get to the honeymoon story in due course. But um, one of the themes that emerges very strongly is, is passion, the passion that many people in the music world have for opera, the art form and the music. How did that passion get its hooks into you? I suppose... Um my first memories of music are still very strong and I can still go into a Catholic church, for example, where there's been a high mass and if there's been incense, it's like a drug and I go right back to those days at St Anthony's Clavelli when the mass was in Latin and we sang Gregorian chant and I found the idea of a priest dressing up with altar boys all over the place and furibles and bells and smells and whistles and gongs and a choir behind which was unseen was very theatrical and I saw very much the altar as a place of theatre. I had no idea what was going on but I did at least find that incredibly interesting and the title give me excess of it, uh, arose from a conversation that I had with some staff at um, a retreat, if you like, with Pam McMillan, if you can call booksellers going anywhere to talk about books a retreat. And I was, you know, everyone had been giving ideas about what I should call this book. The best actually came from Mary Valentine from the Recital Centre. And she said the book should be called Tell Someone Who Cares. <laughs> so... <laughs> And then she said to me the other day, actually, if you'd said that, that could be quite offensive, so I'm glad you didn't use it. Anyway, I was talking to a Pan McMillan, the wonderful Tom Gilliatt, and I said, how about if music with the food of love play on, give me excess of it? Because I am a creature of excess, and that's not necessarily a good thing. And that was it. That's how the title happened. And I guess from... Very early on, I was hungry to know about music. And it's what I call, I see it in students, and it's what I call the chromosome effect. Something clicks. You have no idea what it is, but it turns them onto music, and they have to have it. And that's how I was. Because there's wonderful stories about how you fought and fought and fought to get access to music and to get uh, piano lessons, for example, in the teeth of indifference or, or hostility from various quarters. And there's a wonderful passage, maybe you could tell us about it, how your first journey towards your first piano lesson happened with a bit of uh, precipitate energy. Now, are you referring to... The bicycle. Oh, my God. Uh... <laughs> We, I went to a school in Eastwood, New South Wales, called Morris Brothers Eastwood, and it was determined that I would be called a soloist. And in order to be a soloist at school, a treble, um, we had to go to a, about a mile away by bike to this lady whose name was Miss Gardol, and she used to teach us by rote the music. And to get there, we had to borrow bikes. And... I asked a friend of mine, may I borrow your bike to ride? And he said, yeah, it's a fixed wheel bike. And I had no idea what that meant. And so I got on the bike and it was fine because the journey there was basically uphill until we started coming downhill and I couldn't stop the bike pedalling. So I was going like a maniac towards uh, a crossroad and screaming at the top of my voice, look out, look out, which I'm sure was very helpful for any oncoming traffic. And then a car shot in front of me, 
I'm where I heard my first four-letter word. And he was describing me adjectivally and what I could do with various parts of my anatomy. And God knows how I survived that, but it was absolutely terrifying. It was terrifying. So, um, but then I must say, we got to the solo lesson and we learnt a lovely piece from Judas Maccabeus and went back that night and sang it at the Estedford. So... That was, a, that was a very scary one. That was the same teacher. This isn't in the book, but um, when I was very young, my hands were covered in warts. The back of my left hand and the back of my right hand absolutely covered with warts. And I was hoping this voice teacher would teach me piano. And um, my father took me to her house, which we knew exactly where it was, and she said, came and sat down, and she said, put your hands on the piano. And I put my hands on the piano and she screamed. She said, oh, get your hands off the piano. Get them. What is that? What is that? And I didn't know what she was talking about. And she said, um, I said, they're warts. And she said, you can't play the piano with that. You can't play the piano with warts. And that was that. And I thought, oh, my God, this is terrible. There's nothing I had to do about my warts. And what happened was when I was nervous, they'd go red. So it was like a neon sign. <laughs> And then my mother took me to a wonderful GP and the GP said, what I'll do is I'll give you some pills to take for the warts and what will happen is this. You take your first pill and in 15 minutes you'll be dizzy. So you have to lie down. And that dizziness will only last 15 minutes, then you can get up. And I did exactly that. The power of suggestion was extraordinary. I used to look at my watch. And right on 15 minutes, I go, mm. <laughs> And then after 15 minutes, I go, not dizzy. And I took all of them. They're obviously placebos. And I took them all and nothing happened. And I went back and I said, it didn't work. And he said, well, this is what you do. You take a stick very early in the morning, go out into the backyard, pick up the stick and hold it over your hand and say, Go away. <laughs> and you repeat that three times on each hand. And I did that. And one morning, I went out there and gone. I'm telling that is the, that is the truth. Now, that's not in the book. Um, because it's not about miracles, apparently. <laughs> but that I'm here to tell you that is the... Uh, my brothers can testify to that because my hands were covered in warts, huge warts, red, horrible, inflamed warts. And that morning I looked and I went, gone. Amazing. Yep. Well, back to Catholicism, which you mentioned briefly as the, the kind of starting point for your exposure to music. When you write about Catholicism, it's pretty clear that the Lord gave it, but he also took it away. Mm -hmm. So there were some huge drawbacks. Tell us about that. Catholic school was... Uh, I started school when I was four years and four months and I went to a Josephite convent in uh, Clovelly called St Anthony's and I was dying to go to school. School was the most important thing in my whole life, to be at school. And then we had this very unfortunate nun called Sister Mary Rita, who was um, a virago and a sort of a, a religious volcano and who screamed at us. And it terrified me. It absolutely terrified me. And we would, there were two things about it. One was loving the Lord. You had to love the Lord more than anything in the whole world or you would go to hell. And the other thing was being male. And Sister Mary Rita was not a lover of boys by a long chalk. And she had the class divided into three rows and there were letters on each row. There was VG... G and H. Very good, good, hopeless. <laughs> and I was in the back row of the hopeless. <laughs> so my mother, my mother, may she rest in peace, um, my mother was at church one day. She said, oh, isn't it marvellous, Florence? Richard's in the H row. That must be the honours. <laughs> and her friend said, no, it's... Uh, hopeless 
No, I know there was a visit from my mother to the convent because you could hear the explosions at the other end of Clovelly. But <laughs> I also know that as a result of that, w you suffer. And it was no different when I went to the Marsh Brothers because we were caned mercifully, mercilessly, daily. For, and for ignorance and all sorts of things. And at one point, just before, a really important musical moment for you. Yeah, that was... You know, caning was... Anyone who was of my generation was caned, I imagine. If you went to a Catholic school, you were caned. And I was caned every day from the age of seven to the age of 15. And I remember doing my... Uh, it was my fifth grade piano exam. And I was playing cricket, not playing cricket. Let's be serious. I didn't ever do that. I was at a wicket holding a pig handle. <laughs> and we were trained to, we were trained on to bat with pick handles at very wide wickets. So the bowler had a very good chance and you had none. <laughs> <clears throat> and I was terrified and it was my turn to go into to hold the pick handle, which I did. And I put the pick handle down in front of the ball, which was bowled at a huge rate. And I stopped the ball and it shied off the pick handle over the fence into the brother's house through a window. <laughs> So the whistle went brrrr, and in those days, in the, what was known as the other yard, we had two yards, the schoolyard and the other yard. We were in the other yard, and when the whistle went, you stopped dead. No one moved. And he called out, he went, he pointed, and he said, Gil, smart Alec, up here. And so I stood uh, at the lines, and then I had to march my way back to the schoolyard behind his class and then he said we'll show you what it's like to be a smart Alex son and he gave me four on my right hand to start with and then four on my left hand which was illegal in any terms uh, and two of the I remember vividly two of the cuts on my right hand came across my wrist so that I actually couldn't bend my wrist and my parents said you've got a piano exam on the week's time and you're not playing. I said, I'm doing general knowledge. <laughs> so I wasn't prepared to say I've been caned for being a smart ass, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But look, you know, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I uh, infer sometimes during the book that the, your forthrightness grew out of that crucible in a way. Look, I guess we saw, my friends and I saw the, the brothers as natural enemies. So it was a matter of survival. And we did find, I mean, I'm sure we made their lives hell. And we even had a little group of us had a saying that every time a teacher came into the room, you had to stand and say, good morning, brother, and may God bless you. And we would add, and may your life be short. <laughs> <clears throat> well, how, did you, how did you reconcile that kind of you know, casual brutality of every day with the, the passion and the glory and, and the wonderfulness of the music that you were starting to come into contact with? I think, I think it was because the music kept me sane. The music was the thing... Um, you know how children know who's good in, in a class. You know that. So and so, there's a boy called Brian Levitt, rest in peace. He was spectacular at maths. There's a boy called Ken Smiley, rest in peace. What he couldn't do in calculus no, wasn't worth knowing. He was fantastic. You know who's good. And I was a general maths boy. And we were the, always at the back of the room. And you just did the examples. Page 10 to 20, do the examples. The answers are in the back. And the book was called Baker and Born Algebra, or whatever it was. But I know that when the music came around, when we had to do a show or we had to sing, sing in the choir, whatever it was, that, to me, everything vanished then. Nothing seemed to matter. And that's, I think, that's basically how I survived. There's a wonderful progression through the book from this, um, the feelings of self-doubt sometimes on, on your behalf um, through to a feeling of confidence that you'd chosen the right path and that music was for you and that you started to be uh, more confident that you knew enough about music or you, you'd started anyway. What, do you remember a turning point where you thought, yes, I'm on the right track, I can do this? Um, I guess 
going to the conservatorium, being accepted into the conservatorium, I tried once and failed, and they told me why. That was good. And then I tried the second time I got in, and I felt very good about that, the fact that I actually got into the conservatorium. And then it started again because I had my first piano lesson, and um, that, was, that was wonderful. Day one, I'm at the Sydney, the New South Wales Conservatorium of Music, 18 of us chosen to do this course from all over New South Wales. And um, I went to my first piano, it was half past two on a Monday afternoon. And my teacher was Dallas Haslam, who'd just come back from the Juilliard School. And I played the Chopin A major polonaise. I thought, he's just going to be dazzled to insanity (laughs) to hear this. And then he said, "Um, what do you want to do? (laughs) And I said, oh, I want to be a concert pianist. And he said, well, you need to be able to play the piano to do that. (laughs) And um, you can't. I went, oh, okay. So he said, not only can you not play the piano, your hands in the wrong place, you have no idea how to pedal, and you have no idea how to join sounds. So what we'll do is we'll start with the thumb on middle C, (laughs) and we'll just practice. You know, I was thinking, my career is over in two seconds flat. But when I look back on that, he was right. He was absolutely right. I had everything in the wrong order. So he was right. And what I just... And then that, that first week was a series of shocks right through the whole thing because I went... Then that night, we had a choir rehearsal and I had never read choral music. Everything we'd done at school was taught by rote. I'd never read choral music. So... We were doing the plague choruses to Israel and Egypt by Handel. And we all filed in to the small hall of the conservatory, which is gone now. And this fantastic pianist called Wendy Swan sat down and started to play the introduction to the plague choruses. And I had a sheet of music with just the bass cliff. And on the top it said, Israel and Egypt, bass, 18 and then the children of Israel. And as I sat there, I heard the mezzos, the alto start. I thought, oh my God, this is the most extraordinary thing I've ever done. And I could hear the other voices coming in and I could feel my, like shivering with the excitement. And then the kid next to me started to sing. And I thought, how on earth does he know how to do that? So I thought, I better copy. So I, I held the music up and just that much behind. <laughs> because I didn't know what else to do. I had no idea. I'd never done anything like this. And that night I went home and I played it on the piano so I'd have it re for the next week. But the next day we had a harmony lesson. And who should it be? The professor who was doing the choir. Now, I had never done formal harmony. And on the board, there were eight of us in the class. And on the board was a melody in B flat major with eight bars. And we had to harmonize it in four parts. And he said, um, Are you <laughs> phrase that melody? And I, I went, mm, OK. I guess this is something I should. And I said, What does he mean? <laughs> to the guy next to he said, just go and put a line across the top. So I went out and I went, <laughs> and he said, how do they let people like you into this building? So I could see the career drawing down the drain quite rapidly. It was only day two. But what I realised was I had an enormous amount of catching up to do And when I listened to my colleagues play, they could play. They could really play. One of them was Janet Ritterman, who was, who became the director of the Royal College of Music in London. Janet Ritterman was a fantastic pianist. Um, There were there were dozens of them. There were, you know, really, really good pianists. And what I found I could do was sight read. And I wasn't frightened of reading. And so when somebody said, we need an accompanist, I, I'll do it, and I would play it. Now, 
it wasn't beautiful, but I could stay with them, I could follow it, I could get the rhythm, I could get the harmony. And that, in some ways, I think I talk about that as being the seeds of my own musical destruction, because I could sight read anything, I really could. And once through was enough. So, oh, got that, mastered that one, next. And, but I learnt an extraordinary amount of repertoire. I learnt the violin repertoire, the cello repertoire, the clarinet repertoire, the flute repertoire, the baritone, soprano, mezzo. I was anybody's. <clears throat> I was describing myself as a sunlight soap pianist. Useful for most occasions. <laughs> so, but I learnt an enormous amount about music. And what, did you start to see a niche for yourself in the music yeah. world? What, what, I, what I was seeing was that I probably would do something working with other musicians. The concert pianist, that was belted out of me really quickly, thank God. Um, and then I thought, OK, I, composing started to interest me. I'd not really thought of conducting, but composing certainly started to interest me. And I loved making music with other people, like in, with singers and violinists, etc. I was interested how you were talking about catching up. You had a lot of catching up to do. That phrase recurs again and again throughout the book. Mm -hmm. And you're very firm in your belief that it, it sometimes is not possible to catch up with. That's why we should start children so early. But when I compare that view with your trajectory throughout the book, having started what you call a, a little bit late in your music education with where you ended up and where you are heading. It seems a bit uh, counterintuitive to me. No, um, you never catch up with music, in my view. And the, the issue with music in this country professionally, which is why I've tried to change it for other people, is I've never really been able to focus on one thing other than teaching so, like, to focus on conducting, I would have had to go to Europe and forget about Australia. But I did know, pardon me, that I loved to teach. And when I worked, started working in Marsden High School, I, I really did fall in love with teaching in a spectacular way, and I learned a lot about teaching. And so I dabbled. You know, the, the old expression, jack of all trades and master of none, there, there's some of that. There's no question about that. And it's why I've tried to steer my own students in directions that are quite solid by saying, look, if you're going to be a conductor, then you really need to do this and this and this, and this is how we go about it. But you, if you don't want to do that, then that's fine. But this is what you need to do. And it's very interesting because the five people I've had... Um, now work internationally as conductors or nationally as conductors and they were people to whom I gave millions of hours of my time over a long period of time happily but it was the sort of thing I didn't ever had have so and I don't you know je ne regret rien as they say um, so I didn't have that but I'm determined to see that others who are talented can have it so I don't know if that answers the question, Hilary, but... I don't care. It was interesting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's a wonderfully pivotal moment when you're at Marsden. As I might say, a very young teacher. A lot of these things that Richard so casually mentions happened very young. Hitting the con, going to, to, into teaching, the cushy East End primary school that you ended up at. But there was this wonderful moment when one of your high school students, David Drennan, called you on your teaching style. Where did that lead you? That was... Oh, this is my, one of my favourite stories. This is a year nine class... And as I frequently say to teachers, there are three types of high school student, male, female, and year nine. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a lesson on the Beethoven Fifth Symphony. And it was a textbook lesson. The themes were on the board. We'd sung the themes. We'd listed the instruments of the orchestra. Beethoven, 1770 to 1827, everything. Couldn't be better in my view. We sang the themes, clapped them, played the first movement. The kids were very good, they listened. And then, at the end of it, I asked the classically stupid question. What did you think of that? <laughs> and this kid put his hand up, and he was a kid in a basketball team that I 
coach, believe it or not. And he said, well, look, it's the same old crap over and over again. <laughs> da, 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 da. And all the kids agreed. <laughs> and that, that was... You know they use the word epiphany? I think incorrectly, because I always think about the epiphany as the 6th of January, but anyway. <laughs> it, was a, it was a light that went on, because I suddenly realised, to him, that's what it was. And that was a sensational lesson for me. And from that minute, I stopped teaching like that. I stopped trying to tell these kids that Beethoven was good and would be good for you. And once I got that, I started to teach the kids about, through questioning, how the music worked. And that was, much, that was and I, am, I will never forget that child. That was 50 years ago next year. His name was David Drennan, and he's probably 64. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's fair to say from reading the book that you are not a rel- relativist when it comes to your views on teaching music to children, that you, know, you have quite firm views. Could, I do, yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about them, in particular the off school work? I'm not sure, sure if I'm pronouncing that, yeah. that correctly. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, my views on teaching music are views that I've formed over 50 years, and I believe every child should sing. And I think that there's nothing new about that. But it's not so much that they should sing, it's what and how and what you do with it. And I think with music, we have to understand that music is why we do it with children is it's abstract, it's non-descriptive, and it's meaningless. Now, by that I'm saying, if I go... I'm not describing anything. It's a series of notes falling one after the other that don't necessarily mean anything, but may evoke something in the mind. So when we introduce children to music, we introduce them to the highest order of thinking. They're dealing with an abstraction that has no meaning, which is learned orally first and requires great focus, memory and concentration. And children, young children, have the capacity to remember hundreds of songs, words and tunes, hundreds, and recount them instantly. Now... We do it because in music, the principal reason we teach is for children to make their own music. And they make their own music by listening to a wide range of repertoire, which they then experiment with. And this is where Carl Orff comes into it. And I I studied at the Orff Institute in Salzburg, in uh, the Mozarteum, It was known as the special division of the Mozarteum. It had a sort of, you know, it was called the Sonderabteilung. It sounded like a a, a sort of an institute for deeply disturbed people. (laughs) But this Orff, Karl Orff, said, "Music music for children is like a garden. You plant a seed, an idea grows, you watch it, and then it goes on somewhere else. And everyone was flocky to Salzburg. What's this about? What's our Orff Schulwerk about? And he would never answer the question. He would never say, this is my method. Because it wasn't. I got that one pretty quickly, fortunately, that it wasn't a method. Then when I heard him speak about children making their own music, I thought, OK, what children want then is a teacher who can facilitate the making of their own music, but still give them sequential development. The same was true in Hungary. Zoltan Kordai was teaching children solfa, a system which was invented by a woman, Jane Glover, an English woman, and then later perfected by a man called John Kerwin. 
And Kodai had been brought up on a completely different system. So to turn this system around in Hungary was really interesting. And both approaches happened coincidentally. So, or at the same time, I should say, simultaneously, not coincidentally. And these approaches are now used all over the world to teach children. And the interesting thing about it is that if you give children this experience of music early at an intense level, not only for the sake of it being good and unique, the impact it has on everything else they do is extraordinary. Now, that's not a reason for teaching music. I stress this to everybody. We don't teach music because children are going to be good at languages or maths or going to have neural pathways that are the envy of everybody in the neighbourhood. Okay? <laughs> They're not reasons for teaching music. We teach music because it is unique and it is good. And you don't need any more. However, politicians, parents and principals, the three Ps, get the idea of what I call the bonus parts of music. The bits, the extrinsic parts, as a colleague of mine talks about, the extrinsic benefits of music. And we know the evidence, Hillary, is extraordinary for kids who study music seriously, who go to the next step of, say, playing an instrument as well as singing, that what they know and what they can learn, what they understand, is phenomenal. And the Finns have the most spectacular proof of this, the Finnish education system, why we just don't adopt it. <laughs> Holus bolus, I have no idea. Well, that's my it's next question. Uh, how does all this go down with the uh, entrenched educational understanding in Australia? I sent an email to Peter Garrett today saying that uh, I'd been in Brisbane yesterday talking to 315 music teachers. Queensland, for a long time in this country, has led the way for music education. And when we had the National Review of Music Education, which uh, I like to think I had an influence over with Rod Kemp, when Rod was the junior minister and senator for arts and sport, I had a meeting with him and I said, Senator, Queensland is the great example. And Rod said, Queensland, Richard, Queensland? It's a bit of a joke in the parliament. <laughs> and I said, well, it's not musically. It's a really powerful state. And I was there yesterday. And I spoke to these teachers and said, you know, you people have been doing extraordinary things here for a long time. It's important that we maintain this. And I'm going to send an email to Garrett when I get back saying this. And I'll also tell him that I'm going to have a swipe at standardised testing. Um, because I think standardised testing is the most iniquitous thing that is imposed upon teachers and children. And I did. And I said in the email, um, we had a wonderful time, loved you on q and <laughs> I also had a swipe at standardised testing, that will not be a surprise. So, and then I spoke about a National Institute of Teaching Music, which I'm very keen to establish, and will, and have a meeting later in the year to talk to him about that. So, I'm still battling with these people, because you have to. And it's one thing to throw bombs, but it's another thing to do something about it. And I do believe in not giving up with these people. And we'll, we'll go on to, to talk about throwing bombs and the, the fallout that happens with that in a few moments. But I wanted to touch on one of the other important things that happened in Salzburg, was that your wife, Debbie Maureen, came to visit you. And there's a, a reference to when you met at Marsden High School, and then there's this reference to how she came to visit you in Salzburg. And in the, in the meantime, she lost a fiancé, mysteriously. I think that's uh, that's an interesting omission in the book, but um, just not to not to be flippant about it. I'm wondering about the impact of this phenomenal amount of work that it becomes clear that you've achieved on your family life. Yeah, um, <clears throat> well, I, my wife is sitting here, and the book is dedicated to my wife because without her, I would not have been able to do a single thing. That's absolutely true, and she's an extraordinary person. And she keeps my feet completely on the ground and doesn't take any nonsense from me whatsoever. <clears throat> but in fact, she's a very difficult person to live with. <laughs> <clears throat> and she thinks I'm hard work. But it is, uh, she is an extraordinary woman, an extraordinary mother, and she has more than a fair share of common sense. 
And we'd met at school, at, we'd met together teaching, and we had this crazy sort of relationship. The kids thought it was hilarious. The kids thought we were very disturbed people. <laughs> but they loved it because we were a bit zany and we weren't like other teachers. And then we went our separate ways, and then we met up in Salzburg, and then we decided we'd get married. It was unbelievably romantic. <laughs> and, and for our honeymoon, we went to a motel... 500 yards away from the Strathfield Town Hall. So <laughs> I'm the last of the great romantics. Um, then we went to the markets the next morning and went to two other weddings that weekend. But I do, uh, there was a, a statement made by the editor, the lovely Sybil Nolan, who I hope is here tonight. Sybil was my fabulous editor and she said, um, We've read a lot in the book so far about the dog, Louie, the poodle, but we don't know much about your wife or your children. <laughs> Do you think you might remedy that? So, <laughs> so you put in the story about the honeymoon? Yes, we had the honeymoon story. Do you really want me to tell you that story? Maybe Harry? we'll leave that as a mysterious and amusing and just slightly racy one for you to read when you buy the book. Correct. <laughs> the, 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 the sealed section. <laughs> I'm going to just skip over the time in London, even though it made for fantastic reading and your students in particular. I just love their response to the BBC newsreader on the program. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, children. Oh, they, we used to have this singing program. These were kids in the East End of London. I mean, unbelievable. I love these kids to death. They were wild, 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 wild. And this guy, every Monday morning, would take the music program and he'd say... Hello, children! It's singing time again! And my kids would say, and you said, Hello, shithead! <laughs> but I wasn't supposed to hear it. Can you imagine? <laughs> but these, these kids were... I had... That was probably the closest I've ever come to a, a genuine nervous breakdown, was working with these kids. But I did have one of the things that I used to get them to do was a sort of ritual, and one of them was to say, what a lot of little bottles lying in the gutter. And I'd say, now off we go, guys, and they'd go, what a lot of little <laughs> bottles lying in our gutter. <laughs> and I'd say, no, not nearly, nearly. And they'd go even more, glad they'd go, what <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I'd never get it. But, the best thing was a kid once said to me, a, a, a grade four child, what we call grade six here, put his hand up and he said, hey, sir, do you go home every night? And I said, yes. He says, to Australia? <laughs> and they had no idea. And I said, yes. <laughs> that was followed by, do you fly? <laughs> Just, they were, many. Those kids were hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> well, to leap back to Australia, you, you talk at one point about the mania for opera in Australia in the 60s and the opera house was in train. <laughs> what was it like to be working in the industry at that time and living the music at that time? In the 60s, I was teaching in the 60s and the idea of the opera house was being the, um, put forward and that it was going to be a terrible waste of money to put an opera house down there and destroy the tram sheds and uh, who wants an opera house anyway? It's stupid and we need other things and on and on and on. But I was going to the opera then and as students we used to, we had this terrific hunger for things like opera and concerts. We used to sleep in the street. Um, the night before, I remember sleeping in the street to hear Yehudi Menuhin and Hepsi Bar Menuhin do the Beethoven sonata, uh, the Beethoven violin piano sonata uh, cycle. And we slept in the street. The concert was Saturday. We slept Thursday and Friday to get seats. Because we could only get seats on the stage. They were 10 shillings each. It was a lot of money. But and we used to sleep in the streets for all sorts of things to get seats. But there was a real interesting opera. People and there were great singers, and Sutherland was already, in spite of the fact that she was in London, was a household name, and the idea that she would come home one day was so exciting, and she did, in 1965. And this friend of mine called Dom Neville, who now lives in Canada, and I, we went every night for five weeks. <laughs> every night. It cost a 
fortune. And, but I, those nights in the theatre with Sutherland, Pavarotti, Pavarotti was unknown. Pavarotti, they, everyone's saying, who is this tenor? Because Alberto Remedios was the sort of the head tenor, you know, like the head honcho tenor. And this Italian boy sang the elixir of love. And when he sang Una Fortiva Lagrima, the house went insane. It was, they were thrilling nights. And I will never forget Faust, the opening night of Faust. And they used to do, in those days, the opera started at eight, and they did curtain calls at the end of each act. And Faust has five acts. <laughs> so, you know, at half past 12, they're still on stage. <laughs> and they were doing the, you know, the big trio at the end of Faust before the chorus. And Sutherland singing, Ange Radio, which was in the centre of the stage, and she sailed down towards the prompt box, and Romadios caught up to her, and then Spiro Malas was singing in Memphis, he caught up, and the music, as you know, gets higher and louder, and Sutherland soared above these guys, and they were pumping it out. It was, it was electric, and at the end of the trio, the house exploded. Like, I've never seen an audience explode. And then this woman screamed out, Philistines, morons, idiots, don't you know the opera? There's more to come. And so we all screamed back at her, shut up. And it was like football, you know? But it was thrilling. And Don, my friend Don, used to think that I knew every note of every opera and could tell them what was the highest note. And Sutherland had all these E flats. And during one every scene, you see, you go, what was that? And I'd say, it was an E flat. Oh. What was that? What was that? It was a top D. Oh. It, it was, they were wonderful, wonderful days. Well, that elitism argument continues today. I mean, how do yep. you respond to people who say, look, why do we need to spend so much money on opera when, say, we could be diverting some of that into teaching better music to young children in schools? My view is it shouldn't be a choice. It's, saying, it's like saying sport or music. Should children have sport or music? It shouldn't be a choice. Children should have a lot. It's very interesting, or the lot. It's interesting that we can always find money for sports venues. We might have a problem with that. Money's for oval. We can always find money for that. But... When it becomes a cultural thing, there's a debate. There's always a debate. Now, we, this, I run Victorian Opera at the moment. We don't have a theatre. We've been gypsies for seven years. Now, that's been an advantage in some ways. But sooner rather than later, the town, Victoria, Melbourne, needs a good lyric theatre. And there is one here, the Madge. The Madge, if we could convince Mike Walsh to turn it into an opera theatre. There's a fabulous pit in the match, a fabulous pit. And the acoustic is beautiful, and it seats 1,700. That's the perfect size for a lyric theatre. And it was the home of opera in Melbourne. Gertrude Johnson started opera in, in this country. I mean, there's a, a fantastic legacy of singers from Melbourne. Melbourne was the, leading the way in opera for a long time. And could again, you think? And could again. Let's not revisit that tiresome Melbourne-Sydney thing because you've, you've had to deal with that many times in the course of your career. I have, indeed. <laughs> but uh, when you took over the reins of Victorian opera, when it, when it began, you basically entered Melbourne under a kind of arch of machetes, didn't you? The naysayers were out in force right from the start. How do you run a functional musical organisation and do good things under those circumstances? Look, um, when I was appointed, there was a discussion about the fact that I was from Sydney, and that was probably an issue, um, and that also I was working for Opera Australia at the time. That was seen as an issue. I was ex described as a spy from Opera Australia, <laughs> and the other one was a plant. I was a plant from Opera <laughs> Australia, and I was still working at Opera Australia, so I used to go to the office every morning and say, cactus at two o'clock... <laughs> So the Melbourne-Sydney thing is hilarious. I, I love it to death. And I actually refer to it in my book where I talk about the Paris end of Collins Street. And I, Barry Humphreys is the one I love here, where Barry Humphreys says, I have no problem 
with the Paris end of Collins Street, I just haven't seen the Melbourne end of the Champs-Élysées. <laughs> so I've, I think I've handled the naysayers fairly well. And some of it's been really tough, like really tough. Well, sabotage. Yeah, yeah. Phone calls and all sorts of weird things about casting and you cast this person and you like that person and you don't like this person and bang. And dodgy emails and all that sort of thing. Um, that's, look, that's part. My view is if you sit up on a wall, people are going to throw things. Sometimes it'll be a flower. Sometimes it'll be a brick. So my view was this. The, the Opera Australia stroke Victorian Opera amalgamation was not an amalgamation. You, you can't um, make an amalgam of unlike things. And even though it was opera was the thing in common, the basis for it wasn't right. Now, I don't write about it in my book, and neither do I write about the Simone Young circumstance in Sydney. And the reason I don't is I don't know all the facts. So I don't go into the area. And I certainly didn't want to refuel the idea when I was starting a company that all that negativity and hate. Now, I know there are people who will never forgive Opera Australia. I understand that. I know there are people who will never forgive me for being here in Melbourne. It should have been other people. But my view has been Victoria should have its own opera company. Singers are one of Australia's natural resources. There are plenty in Victoria. Now, we're now seeing the fruit of that. Next, next week... Two of our kids, for the first time in a long time, are finalists in a national singing competition, the Marty competition. Victorian, young Victorian singers, and, and there, the others, there's one from Queensland, one from New South Wales, and one from WA, but two from Victoria. And we've been gradually building that. We've been going out to the communities. We now have hubs at Warrnambool, Shepparton, Sale, Bendigo, Ballarat, where we visit regularly, work with children, work with the community, work with choirs, and we don't come in and say, it's very good for you to have an opera, we'll be here next week and we'll then <laughs> arrive Tuesday, go Wednesday. We say, what would you like? What are your needs in this community? How can we as a company service what you need as far as opera, singing or theatre goes? And so... That has kept me going. And there's also something about being told you can't do it <laughs> that I rather like. And <laughs> one of my colleagues from <clears throat> Opera Australia said, you won't last six months. It's doomed. <laughs> well, I'm here to say, eat your heart out, colleague. <laughs> I know that my successor is planning 20, well, 2013's done. 2014, 2015, and 2016. So next year is the eighth year, and I leave after a pantomime. And I love the idea that I'm going with something for family audiences and for children, which is Sleeping Beauty. Tickets are on sale now. <laughs> well, we'll have time for questions in just a moment, but I want to finish off with the, the, the final point. Throughout the book, you make a really valiant attempt, Richard, to underplay your achievements. Truly valiant, doomed, because about halfway through the penny drops for the reader, that, but people keep snapping you up for these amazing musical projects and you keep instigating them because the last one has worked so well. Is there going to come a time when you slow down? What's next for you? Well, I'm really determined about this National Institute of Music teaching. And I know the bureaucrats are going to say that's the last thing we need. And when they say that, you know it's probably right, that we need it. And the other thing I'm very interested in is establishing an orchestra of classical players. We did Figaro here with a completely classical orchestra, that is instruments from the classical period. And we did it at Mozart's tuning and at a temperament. And the players said, why can't we keep this together and work? And we're going to, we're, we're looking at it, we're going to do it. Because we have in this country six network orchestras and two opera and, opera and ballet orchestras. Finland, I'm going back to Finland, has 33 orchestras with a population of 5.4 million. <laughs> Hundreds of community choirs where everyone picks up the music and reads it at sight. Now, 
our life in this country could be as culturally rich as that. And so the two projects for me are the classical players and the uh, Institute of Music Teaching. And also we have three grandchildren and I, I don't want them to grow up missing out on as much time as I did with my own children, which I talk about in the book, and that's where my wife was sensational. And my grandchildren are the most perfect children <laughs> that have ever been put on earth. <laughs> Particularly the five-year-old who doesn't suffer fools gladly. They call me Gumby. <laughs> and I was, the five-year-old is, I, I know every grandparent thinks, but she is seriously smart. <laughs> And she was sitting on the couch and I said to her, she was at preschool, and I said, now when you go to preschool next year, you're going to be in the big class, aren't you? And she looked at me and she went, yes. And I said, and then, after you've gone to preschool, you're going to go to big school. And she said, don't be stupid, Gumby. <laughs> don't rattle my cage. And... <clears throat> I love that. I can't miss out on that child. That child is extraordinary, as are her sisters. So it's a very competitive household. Let's go to some questions. We've got about 10 or 15 minutes. There'll be a couple of people with microphones. Anyone who wants to leap forward? Hello, Richard. The, we know that very, very shortly, a third of our population will be over 55. In amongst all of those wonderful people are very uh, accomplished musicians who can't necessarily display fireworks any longer at, in, uh, on their instruments and so forth, but they have a wonderful understanding and background of music. Now, you speak about children. I'm at that si side of life where I'm dying to find somebody else who has reached my age and uh, the schools have dropped off slightly, but the love of music has has increased immensely. Why isn't there some sort of project or program that allows us to meet up with those who did perform and somebody who plays the, the clarinet or what have you? I would love to accompany them. I did a lot of repetitor work and so forth, and I'm dying to find some people at my age who would enjoy some music. Is there any suggestion you could make here? Yeah, I, this is that question is profoundly spooky and as far as I'm concerned it's a very good omen. I was in Brisbane yesterday as I said talking to music teachers about music and I looked around the room and it suddenly occurred to me what do we do for seniors? We have youth choir this and children's choir that and blah 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 and I thought I know what this institute of music teaching should look at harnessing not just the energies of people who are in the force, but people who have been in the force. And you could actually start things such as you're talking about. People who've played piano or who want to accompany, people who want to sing in a choir, people who want to play in an orchestra. And I, that, that idea, quite seriously, occurred to me when I was coming back from talking to these teachers. So. This whole thing about a National Institute of Music Teaching is not just about children, but it's about harnessing the energies around this country. And there are some spectacular people there. And I think we can look at certainly things like um, choirs for... I, mean, I thought of the whole sort of things like the Yuppies Chorale, <laughs> and, you know, the Sharebrokers Ensemble, <laughs> the Merchant Bankers Madrigal Society... <laughs> And so on. I'm quite serious. I mean, the, to reinvigorate the idea of singing. So I really get your question, and it is absolutely something that's very much in my mind at the moment. So thank you for that, that question. And I'm sure we can find ways of using these talents. Any other questions? Um, Richard, this is probably more a comment. I'm sorry that you missed out on being a concert pianist. But... Um, I think what you've given to um, Australia, I guess, over the last few years particularly, well, that I've been aware of, like um, Sing Your Own Opera, um, the wonderful Cinderella last year and all your um, 
turns on spics and specs have given that you are heading in the right direction for us and I know my own grandchildren have sung some of the compositions that you've had at their school so I think probably we've all benefited from you not being the concert pianist so thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm I'm a bit sad that the ABC missed out on a kindergarten of the year presenter. <laughs> Thank you for the comment. And I think Steinway is very grateful too that I'm not a concert pianist, <laughs> even though I own one. Any other questions? Thank you. Or comments? I've got one. There's a fantastic photo in there, Richard, of you at the BMW Edge with hundreds of people standing there and you're talking to them. What's it like working with so many people during, say, a Sing, it, sing Your Own Opera event? Sing Your Own Opera is one of the most wonderful things to do because it's... Um, Basically, everyone comes in for three and a half hours and I hurl abuse at them <laughs> and they seem to enjoy it. So that, actually a student of mine made that comment. He said, I was, I'm training him to do things like this and he said, you are so rude to these people. <laughs> and I said, no, they love it. They, they, you can tell. And what is wonderful about it is to listen to the sound change and everybody feel free to make a contribution. Everybody feels they can make the contribution. Everybody see, and there's no judgment. So um, the idea is in the, uh, this short period of time we have is to make some really good singing and we know the beneficial effects of singing on the body. It's a wonderful form of exercise. So um, that's, I love doing singing around opera and it's something that, people now do all over the place, I think. It's quite an emotional thing too, isn't it, working with someone uh, singing because uh, so many people have had such a judgmental experience in their youth and they have to unlearn all that. We get feedback forms that say, at school I was told I couldn't sing and I came along today and I found I actually could. Or other things like, this has been the best day of my life. And you think, wow, what's been happening? So... <laughs> Or my favourite is, this is the best $30 I ever spent. <laughs> so it's, what it does is, you know, I used to call my kids nightingales, robins, wrens, crows. And so, you know, everyone can see, all birds sing, all birds sing. So, and we all make different sounds. And when you hear them together, you can sense the community becoming alive. I also wondered whether you had a, a favourite piece of music, whether you would care to pin that down. Oh, wow. No, I don't. I, don't. I mean, I have a, my favourite opera is The Magic Flute. But my favourite opera tends to be the one I'm working on at the moment. So, and the moment I'm trying to get this pantomime, that's not favourite, I can assure <laughs> you. It's going to be great. <laughs> And who should we be listening to this century? Who's the up-and-coming uh, voices and composers you'd like to see more of? The great Englishman, a guy called Thomas Ardes. That's an extraordinary talent. Thomas Ardes, he's a 40-year-old-ish, marvellous, marvellous, marvellous English composer. And, I'm going to say it, an 18-year-old who's just gone to Yale. From here, a boy called Philip Jamison... <clears throat> and I know Maureen will say I say this all the time, but in 50 years of teaching, I have never met a more extraordinary musical mind from this child. I've had him since he was 11, and it is a phenomenal, phenomenal musical mind. We'll be hearing a lot from this one. It must be an amazing experience to watch a mind like that grow and flower. What's interesting is the confidence. You know, when he came to me as an 11-year-old, he, he came in with his portfolio and he said, they have sent me to you. <laughs> he was 11. <clears throat> and he, I, I said, what do you want to do? And he said, well, they told me you could teach me composition. I brought my folio, 11. And he said, you can examine my folio, which I did. And I, went, and I put it down back on the piano and I said, OK, I've looked at that. And he said, no, you need to examine it. <laughs> and I said, I didn't. I'm here to tell you what you do is you play the pieces, you press a little print button on your MIDI machine and out comes the... And he said, 
how do you know that? <laughs> and I said, because I'm very, very old. <laughs> and he was quite, quite taken aback. And then I said, I'll teach you on one condition. That at the end of every lesson, I'm going to say to you, do you want to have another lesson? And you can say, no. And I can also say, I don't want you to come back. Do you agree? And so we agreed. And we did that for nine years, uh, seven years. So uh, the most amazing, he came in with a jazz background. And when I introduced him to Bach, the C major cello suite of Bach, he turned to me as an 11 year old and said, who is this Bach? <laughs> and I said, he's a very good composer. And he went home and analysed the D minor Pavan from the cello suites and he came back and he said, you know, Bach actually writes jazz. <laughs> Isn't that heaven? That's pretty good. <laughs> so you learn a lot from 11-year-olds, let me tell you. <laughs> well, look, that, Richard, thank you so much for chatting to us tonight. I, you've described yourself as a peg for which no appropriate hole has yet been found. I say amen to that. Please give Richard a very big hand. Thank you. Thank you.